Hi, I'm Martin Swetman, and in this video I'm going to continue my review of the Young Adrias Impact Debate Research. Now, so far we've covered the published research from the original Firestone paper in 2007 through to the end of 2015 in the last video. So in this video I'm going to review all the papers from 2016. By this time, the Young Adrias Impact is effectively proven only its consequences in terms of megafaunal extinctions and human culture change is really still up for debate. <clears throat> this is because we have a massive platinum spike in Greenland ice that occurs within just a few years of the onset of the Younger Dryas cooling, and that coincides with evidence of extensive biomass burning or wildfires. And we know this is not simply a, a small local impact in Greenland because we have around 15 sites across four continents where evidence of a cosmic impact such as nano diamonds, impact spherules, uh, and iridium enriched framboidal magnetic grains and so on are found in the sediment dating to about the same time with uncertainties of about a hundred years or so. So the evidence is consistent with a collision with a fragmented comet uh, and this kind of impact is expected given the latest observations of the Torrid meteor stream which is by far the largest meteor stream that still crosses Earth's orbit. So let's continue with the papers in uh, 2016. There are four of them, three by Adronikov and Andronikova, uh, and a few others, and one by Holiday, Saravel and Johnson. Now given the strength of the evidence so far, which I've just been through, uh, papers that now take a contrary view to the impact theory uh, can be viewed with some doubt or suspicion as to their motives, as it's really quite an irrational position, uh, position to take from here on, unless of course they have some extremely good evidence of their own. So the first paper that we'll, we'll take a look at from 2006 is this uh, critical paper by Holiday, Surabell and Johnson. So this so-called blind test of the impact theory is written by some established critics of the theory, Vance Holliday and Todd Saravel. Now they sample and analyze the Younger Dryas black mat at a new site called Lubbock Lake in Texas, which is not far, that far from other sites in the US where evidence for the impact has been found. And they look specifically for the amount of magnetic grains and nano diamonds from several samples at various depths across the black mat at this site. Now, importantly, this is a blind test, uh, which in this case means that the samples are given arbitrary labels and are analyzed by both Todd Surravel, one of the authors of the paper, and independently by members of the Comet Research Group, Jim Kennett. Uh, and they, uh, they're analyzed independently, so uh, neither party knows which part of the black mat they are analyzing until the results are returned to a third person. In this case is Walter Alvarez, who's the Nobel Prize winning physicist, famous for discovering the dinosaur killing impact 66 million years ago. And this is what they found. These are their results. So here is a photo of the section of the black mat that they sampled lined up against their results. <clears throat> now the first thing you might notice is that these are quite thick samples compared to the boundary layer um, which is expected to be this uh, thin black section or line here in the photo. The second thing we need to think about is how useful are, is the magnetic grain evidence. We've already established in the first few videos of this series that magnetic grains by themselves are not a reliable indicator of an impact because iron is a common element in Earth's crust and forms part of many minerals. In fact, a couple of studies have shown that it's only the framboidal iridium-rich magnetic grains that are of interest. And as these results don't, these results here in this paper don't distinguish between different types of magnetic grain, they're really of little value here. So we are left with only the nano diamond evidence. And only Jim Kennett from the Comet Research Group analyzed these samples for nano diamonds. Saravel never looked for them. So in the end, we're only interested in the nano diamond evidence from Kennett. 
Now the final important thing about these, these results is that some of them are not new. In fact, the analysis by Surabell was already published in 2010. And we have already reviewed that data in earlier videos. So this is at least partly an old study using old data, but that's okay because we're only interested in the nano diamond data from Kennett, which is new, it hasn't been published before. So what about this nano diamond evidence? What does it show? Well, it's clear that he finds a strong peak in nano diamonds in this top layer here, but none where we expect to find uh, one down here. So this level up here corresponds to the end of the Younger Dryas mini ice age, about 1300 years later than where we expect to find the nano diamonds down here. Well, that's perplexing. I mean, this is completely contradictory to all the other nano diamond evidence that we've got. In fact, <clears throat> in 2014, we saw how at around 15 other sites across four continents, nano diamonds in the region of the Younger Dryas black mat have until now only been found right beneath it at its base at what's called the Younger Dryas boundary and not directly above it. In fact, this is the data from um, the paper in 2014 uh, where the, the nano diamond evidence was um, laid out. Uh, so these are the dates in this column uh, of the layers in which the nano diamonds occur at all these various sites. And uh, we're mainly interested in the, the white uh, horizontal lines here because these are the ones with the, the smallest uncertainty in the ages of those layers. So as you can see, for about, uh, for all of these white sites here and the two here from independent research groups, and for the layer in Greenland, highlighted in green here, uh, the nano diamonds are confined to the onset of the Younger Dryas period, not the end of it. In fact, if we look at this data from Bull Creek, so this is a paper by Bemin et al. that we also reviewed in an earlier video. So Bull Creek is in North Carolina, again, not so far removed from Lubbock Lake in Texas. Uh, we see that there are only two strong nano diamond peaks, one at the base of the Younger Dryas black mat, exactly where we expect, and a more modern nano diamond peak. So how on earth can nano diamonds now be found above the black mac at Lubbock Lake and not right under it? It just doesn't make any sense at all. In fact, given this earlier na nano diamond evidence, which I've just shown you, and also the fact that Vance Holliday, the author of this paper, has previously been less than straight with his interpretation of other evidence, I think we can be somewhat suspicious of this data. So let's look more closely at what's happened here. Let's go back to the method section and see how the samples were taken. So here we are. I've highlighted it in yellow, the appropriate section. But all it says is that six samples were collected. It doesn't say who by. And then it says the samples were sent to the respective labs of Surreville and Kennett, implying that neither was involved in taking the samples, because this is a blind test, right? So in which case, who actually took the samples? The answer is we don't know. Was it Vance Holliday himself? Which would be odd given this is supposed to be a blind test and that would compromise it being a blind test. You'd want to remove any of the authors from knowing anything about the provenance of the samples. So it's not clear that this really is a blind test. And given we don't know who actually collected the samples. Taken at face value, of course, these results clearly contradict the Younger Dryas impact theory. But given all the other evidence we have from several independent research groups at around 15 sites across four continents that contradicts this evidence, and given that we don't know who collected these samples, I think the only way to resolve this discrepancy is to analyze this site again. I'm fairly sure that if this work was repeated, we'd get a different result. Basically, I'm saying I don't trust these results. They don't make sense because they contradict all the other evidence and the motives and methodology of these authors is suspect. 
Now it's okay in science to ask for work to be repeated. It's standard practice to repeat experiments if they give completely unexpected results. So it's fine to call for this site to be resampled, but of course it should be done by an independent group unconnected to these authors or the Comet Research Group. Okay, so let's move on from this uh, disquieting paper, which raises all sorts of questions about academic integrity. I don't think we can say anything more about it until that site is resampled. So let's move on to the three other papers from 2016. Now each of these three papers is co-authored by Andronikov and Andronikova. And they all do more or less the same thing uh, in three slightly different contexts. So all of these papers sample the Younger Dryas boundary at the base of the black mat and analyze them in terms of their elemental composition, focusing especially on rare elements that might provide clues as to whether a comet impact occurred or not. Now in the first paper, they specifically examine hollow framboidal magnetic microspherules from the base of the black mat. So these are the special kind of magnetic grain. Uh, and they do this uh, at this site, a uh, particular site in Texas called Blackwater Draw, which is not far from the site we just looked at, Lubbock Lake. So here are some of the uh, some electron microscope ob pictures of the objects that they examine. The, you can see the framboidal or patterned surface of these um, hollow microspherules. And in their second paper, uh, they look at the whole of the Younger Dryas black mat, mainly from the Murray Springs site in Arizona, which we are familiar with through the work of several different groups, including Vance Haynes and Fayek et al. And again, this site is not far from Lubbock Lake. And finally, in their third paper, they sample the whole of the Younger Dryas black mat again, but at several sites in uh, the Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, and this work is co-authored with Van Hussel uh, et al, who have previously been quite critical of the impact theory. So what do they find? Let's go back to the first paper. Uh, well, their papers are quite technical and lengthy uh, with a lot of detailed discussion. But looking at specifically at the magnetic spherules from Blackwater Draw, they, their results essentially agree with the work of previous authors like Fayek. Uh, and they suspect that these kinds of spheral could have a meteoric origin. Let's have a look at their results, which I've highlighted. So they say, um, because overall, the close chemical, mineralogical and structural similarity of these hollow microspherules to those direct, directly related to known meteorite occurrences, uh, the cosmic origin of the former seems to be a credible hypothesis. And then they say the presence of the high number of such microspherules in the sediments can serve as a local stratigraphic marker in identification of the Younger Dryas boundary. So that's essentially as strong a conclusion as they want to make. Essentially, they're being very cautious here. Other authors have been more forthright. What's also interesting is that they don't find any obvious elemental signature like raised iridium or platinum in the spherules that they analyzed. Uh, because that, and that would clearly indicate that they are the product of a, a cosmic impact. So I think that's why they are cautious. Other authors like Thayek and Heinz or Haynes have, ra have found raised levels of iridium in the magnetic spherules that they analyzed. These authors only looked at four spherules in total, so uh, they haven't looked at a wide range of the spherules from this site. In the end, though, they are cautiously supporting the impact theory. The next paper, which looks at the sediment across the black mat at Murray Springs in particular, is also interesting. So here is their main result this plot. So we're looking at the, the depth in the sediment down here, along with the abundance relative to crustal values. Uh, you can see the, the scale at the top there. Uh, for various of the, the elements. And as we can see very clearly, there are several spikes in some of these rare elements, exactly where we expect to see them 
at the base of the black mat. So the solid line here, this quite high peak, is for nickel, uh, sorry, is for yttrium. Uh, the dotted line here is for a combination of rare earth elements. And this dashed line here is for cobalt. Now there's another line here, uh, which you can just about see for nickel. So cobalt and nickel and these other rare elements are associated with um, meteorites. And the position of these peaks is in the region of, or is in between uh, 4 MS10 and 5 MS10. And if we look at the picture of this site, we can see that 4 MS10 and 5 MS10, that's around here, that's right at the bottom of the, the black mat Oops, at this site. So the conclusion is that the Younger Dryas boundary at Murray Springs is consistent with a cosmic impact, as we expect. Now, just as interesting is their analysis for other elements at this exact same level. So these plots compare the levels of various <coughs> rare elements, which are listed along the bottom, relative to the average crustal values. Specifically for these sections that we're interested in 4 MS10 and 5 MS10 and so on. And they're compared with the abundances of these elements in the back black mat um, below and above, and also with the black mat itself, which is this plot. And what you can see is that the base of the, these four sections from the base of the black mat have a completely distinct character from these other sediments above and below and within the black mat itself. But what does this specific signature mean? What is it indicating? So to answer that, the authors also analyzed charcoal particles from some other sites. Here we go. And specifically, they looked at charcoal particles uh, found in from about the same time, the end of the Paleolith Paleolithic, from Netherlands and France. And again, they get the same signature for these charcoal particles. So what this means then is that the base of the black mat at Murray Springs is very likely loaded with charcoal particles. It's just that they are microscopic, so small that so far they've been completely missed. So basically, there is a very fine soot in this boundary layer, the Younger Dryas boundary. Now this is interesting because it shows that extensive wildfires occurred here too in the US, in this region of the US, as well as in the Netherlands and France. And so far the lack of evidence for wildfires, or in other words, lack of charcoal, in the US Younger Dryas boundary has been used as evidence against the impact theory, uh, although this is not something I've previously covered in these videos. So what this data shows then is that the impact events here in the US were so intense that only the fine soot was produced. Larger particles were somehow not produced or ground up into a microscopic fine powder. And how this happened is not exactly clear. Now in their final paper, they essentially do the same kind of analysis for these uh, several sites in Belgium and the Netherlands. Here they are. And they find the same charcoal signature in, what, in, uh, in these, uh, these sites in, in what is known as the Oslo horizon. It's essentially just the Younger Dryas boundary. So here are the plots that show we have the same kind of signature at these sites and that this signature is distinct from the layers of sediment above and below the Younger Dryas boundary. Now there seems to be uh, the strength of this signal at these various black mat sites in Belgium and Holland, or the Netherlands, don't seem to have the same intensity everywhere, which I suppose is what you'd expect because the vegetation levels would not have been the same everywhere. Now, in addition to analysing the charcoal from these sites, they also analyse the sediment for platinum group metal abundances. Now, this data is not so easy to see. It's recorded in these tables. So you have to search through these tables, looking, looking at the numbers 
for the various sections or layers at each site. And then you have to uh, cross check, <coughs> and then you have to cross check those numbers against the photographs for the black mats at each site to find out where those particular sections are relative to the younger dryas boundary that we're we're interested in. Anyway, if you do, and it would have been helpful if they could have actually plotted this rather than uh, the reader having to do this themselves. Anyway, if you do uh, go through that in detail, what you'll find is that uh, as a group, uh, for the platinum group metals as a, as a whole, the highest levels across all of the, uh, the platinum group metals consistently occurs at the base of the black mat in each case. Now there are some significant spikes in some of these metals in other locations, but the most consistent excess across the whole group of metals does appear at the base of the black mat. Uh, and that's essentially their conclusion. They say, we tentatively relate, so they're now talking about the charcoal signature, we tend to tentatively relate this feature to the presence of abundant charcoal fragments resulting from extensive biomass burning. But then they say, uh, the sediments experience the addition of compositionally anomalous materials during a short event at the beginning of the at the onset of the Younger Dryas period, and the presence of a possible meteoric component in the sediments suggests that an extraterrestrial event, in other words an impact, occurred at approximately the same time. Okay, so we're going to summarize those four papers now. It began, the year began, with a strange paper by Holiday et al. that seems to contradict the Younger Dryas impact theory. But that work is, in my view, itself suspect because it's at odds with just about all the other data we have. In fact, the only group really, it seems, who are unable to reproduce the data of the Comet Research Group are groups involving Holiday and Surreville, who are its most ardent critics. Everyone else has been able to reproduce the Comet Research Group's data just fine. So I think that some suspicion falls on them. Then we have papers by Andronikov and Andronikova, who consistently find evidence in terms of elemental analysis that supports the impact theory uh, on two continents. Okay, so that's 2016. In the next video, we'll move on to consider research published in 2017. If you enjoyed this, then please take a look at my book and my blog.